Hello, uh, welcome to uh, the second and main lecture on guessing random and additive noise decoding or GRAND uh, for our um, Padovani lecture. Um, I'm assuming at this point that uh, you know the basics of uh, entropy and of uh, typical sets. Uh, if you don't, uh, there is a first lecture in the series, which is a brief introduction. Um, so if you've had a course in information theory, um, even a very initial course, then you don't need to watch that first lecture. Otherwise, uh, please go ahead and, and watch that first lecture. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, share my slides. And all the slides are going to be also available as part of the course materials. All right. Uh, so this is the main topic of my lecture, Guessing Random Additive uh, Noise Decoding, or GRAND. Uh, this is all work done with Ken Duffy of the Hamilton Institute at Maynooth University in Ireland. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. And in particular, let's um, remind ourselves of the principles of coding. Um, there are really two types of coding. One is source coding or compression, where I take data and I, in effect, compress it by making it more efficient in terms of storage. So I use sparsity in the data in order to provide a more efficient, shorter representation. Let's look here. I have uh, four chunks of data. Let's say maybe each of these is 100 bits. And I'm able to represent it with only 200 bits. So let's think that I have a source S. Uh, I can look at the entropy of the source S. So um, remember that I assume you've watched the first video to know about entropy. This is Shannon entropy. Um, and what will happen here is that suppose that this source S has, say, entropy of one half. It means that for every uh, two bits here, I only need one bit out of, uh, of uh, representation. And the way to think about it is that if I look at the tip, of, if I look at this set, which has two to the 400 possibilities, the typical set only has two to the 200 possibilities. And therefore, I'm able to look at um, the size of that typical set, um, which is two to 200 and represent it with only 200 bits. Uh, the second type of coding is channel coding, where I take the data that has been compressed and I now do something which may sound a little bit counterintuitive because I just went and removed redundancy. I'm going to add redundancy, but I may add redundancy in different ways than the naturally occurring redundancy. We'll look later at how I add that redundancy. That is um, the topic of uh, channel coding. So for instance, you have two bits, but I represent it by, um, I have 200 bits, I represent it by 300 bits, say three chunks of 100 bits each. Um, and very often we'll denote by X, the representation of the data that is sent down a channel. So the process here of going from 200 bits to a function of those 200 bits, which is uh, 300 bits long, is called channel coding. Uh, and this X is then sent over a channel, which has some deleterious effect, uh, is going to distort uh, or in some way um, uh, change the data that is being sent. So here you see the representation here in this uh, middle chunk uh, of a lighter data means that it has been in some way um, polluted. Uh, and what we have is an output X, where the pollution effect is generally represented uh, by a noise N. So that's what we call the channel transmission noise N. Uh, one of the simplest models uh, to, to think about is in this, uh, in this context is something called the binary symmetric channel, or BSC or binary symmetric channel, where say that you had a binary input of zeros and ones, and typically the uh, inputs are not binary, 
um, they're made of symbols that are not zero one, um, but even over channels where the transmission is not binary, the representation of the data is often considered to be binary. And for all of those you, of you who have taken a communications course, uh, this is probably quite familiar. And the binary symmetric channel, if I have zeros or ones going in, we'll have zeros or ones going out. And there will be a, what we call a crossover probability that a one will turn into a zero or a zero will turn into a one. So we can call the crossover probability P or epsilon. So with one minus P probability, there will be no change in the input. And with pre probability, there will be a flip. It's called symmetric here because the probability of going from zero to one or one to zero is the same. How does this correspond to noise? Well, imagine that I am in binary, so I'm in a Galois field of size two. So what would happen here is that X would be zero or one and it would be an XOR of, um, it would be an XOR of X with the noise to give me y, that would be a representation that is an additive representation of the binary symmetric channel. When the n is one, it means that a one becomes a zero or zero becomes a one because the one becomes XORed with a one to become a zero, the zero becomes XORed with a one to become a one. Remember uh, addition in a binary, sim in a, um, uh, binary field is actually XOR in your bits, and that gives me my Y. So here I would have an N, which takes zero, which means no error, with probably one minus P, and becomes uh, one with probability P. And if I have Bernoulli coin tosses um, with probably P of one, uh, probability one minus P of zero, that is a representation of this noise, okay? Um, and this effect then um, is going to actually have um, a effect on how much data I can send, what this rate is, and we'll talk later about how uh, we compute actually this R rate and how it relates to the channel coding and how it relates to the effect of the noise. Okay, and then at the output of the channel, I have this Y and in different ways by hook or by crook and actually the crux of our conversation today will be about how we do this. Um, at the output of the channel, we observe the X and we try to reconstruct the, and we observe the Y and we try to reconstruct the X that was transmitted. Okay, so we look at Y, try to figure out what X was. That's the effect of channel decoding. Then of course there's source decoding to recover the original data. And there's some probability of error in different parts of this, um, uh, of this cycle, particularly over here in the channel decoding. But module that probability of error, I could be doing this over and over again, source coding, channel coding, channel decoding, uh, source decoding, and going on and on and on this way. Okay. So how do we manage uh, this uh, channel decoding that we just talked about? How do we manage that um, that effect of the noise that we just uh, that we just mentioned? Um, well, remember that one of the things that we did is we made the transmission be 300 bits, even though there were only 200 bits to be sent. Why is that? Well, suppose that I shout a message, uh, let's say here, just eight bits, you know, so zero, one, 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 and then the rest uh, all zeros. And suppose there's a noise of the type that I showed you is binary symmetric channel, and the last bit here gets flipped from a zero to a one. If all two to the eight possibilities are valid, I would hear this and I would say, okay, that's it, that's, uh, that's what was uh, transmitted. So. In that case, we would be doomed. So somehow that's not going to work. We have to do something. So what are we going to do? What well, we are going to agree to a code book. So it means that not all two to the eight possibilities uh, can be um, can be valid code words. It's going to have to be a subset of all 
8 bit strings so that you can actually guess what I said. Okay, and that's what Shannon's 1948, 1948 coding theorem says. It states how dense the code books can be while ensuring decode errors are rare. So in the example that we saw in the previous slides, how dense were they? Well, uh, here I had to the 200 possibilities here and to the 300 possibilities. So it was to the 200 out of two to the 300. That's how dense they were. Okay. Uh, and Shannon's coding theorem tells you how dense those, those are. We want those to be as dense as possible so that I am wasting as few bits as possible in redundancy to combat noise. And the topic of practical coding is the construction of codebooks and generally computationally efficient mechanisms for decoding those codebooks, which map a received string, which we've called Y, to an element of the code book, which was uh, X and sometimes we'll call it C, okay? Now, um, let's think here for a bit as engineers. Uh, the engineering need is generally that you would like to have your transmission have delay that is as small as possible. Therefore, you would generally like to have your code words be short. Uh, for those of you who are following, for instance, the conversations around 5G, and the emergence of 6G, you may have heard of ultra-reliable uh, low latency communications. That means actually very, um, very short code words would be, uh, would be um, uh, desirable. We'd also like to have like low complexity. We would of course like to have flexibility. We don't like to be constrained as engineers, which means that we'd like to have uh, different rates. Um, where remember the, the rate is this, notion of density. So here the rate is R, which is 200 over 300. This is a rate of two thirds. And we'll show you later where this formula comes from. So forget about the right hand side here, just have it in mind. But this is a rate of two thirds. Okay. Um, so I'd like to have flexibility. And of course, I'd like to be robust to the physical reality of in particular bursty or correlated noise. Later in the lecture, I'll show you examples, practical examples of such correlated noise. The mathematical model that we have been working with generally um, uh, stemming from information theory has been in many ways quite opposed to these uh, engineering needs or desiderata. We'll talk, typically talk about long codes. Much of the work we do is in large limit of N, N being the length of the transmission, so that you have concentration results. Uh, the focus is often on capacity, so concentration onto correct decoding, we'll see that later. We generally have code constructions that are quite constrained in length and in rate for this practical code constructions, again, Bear this in mind, I'll show you some examples of this later. And finally, and very importantly for the topic uh, of today's lecture, we generally have code specific decoders. So for instance, you have very famous and uh, efficient codes such as Reed Mueller, go with majority logic, Reed Solomon, go with Burlicamp Massey, CRC aided polar codes, I'll tell you more about those later, goes with CRC aided um, uh, successive cancellation list decoding, low density parry check codes, go with belief propagation. You can do belief propagation on other codes. Um, you know, there is some flexibility, but by and large, the decoder is um, uh, suited and designed indeed for a particular encoder and it's often even for a particular rate uh, for that uh, type of code. So it tends to be both code specific and rate specific. We would um, in effect say that to some extent the engineering right now is constrained by the math. Um, and what do I mean by that? It means that, you know, we talk about capacity, 
uh, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in information theory, but let's look really at what's going on in uh, communication systems. Um, the typical bit flip probability in that binary symmetric channel we just looked at is let's say around 10 to the minus three, often 10 to the minus four. That's to say that you get uh, that, that P probability is around uh, one, in a, one in a thousand or even one in 10,000. This means that the channel capacity, the highest rate, which we'll show later uh, how to compute it, is one minus uh, the uh, one minus uh, h of n, where n is that uh, noise with probability, say, ten to the minus three. That p, um, that capacity is really very high, very very close to one. However, if you look at the five G new uh, ra uh, new radio data channel that 3GPP, the body uh, that's um, uh, the it's it's a it's a body that uh, does uh, standardization. It's industry uh, consortium. Uh, they they looking at rates as low as 0.2. They very very seldom, almost never go above 0.1. So we talk about capacity achieving. But systems right now work very far away from capacity achieving and also often with very long codes. Um, the other thing that um, uh, we, we have sort of as a knock on effect of starting with the math rather than starting with the engineering is that we have uh, systems that often use interleaving. We'll talk about interleaving towards the end of the lecture. Interleaving um, often occurs over thousands of bits. It's an effect of mixing of bits to make the channel appear ID, or to make the noise appear uh, independent, identically distributed, to make it look Bernoulli like the description of the binary symmetric uh, channel that we just looked at together. Okay. Whereas real channels will tend to have errors that are bunched together because of uh, the physical effects that lead to those errors. Okay. So we're going to do something completely different. Uh, you students, you're uh, getting started in your career. You don't need to be uh, limited by this, uh, uh, by this um, uh, previous view of the connection between communications and information theory. Let's look at it differently. And that's going to be the vision of grand guessing random additive noise decoding. We're going to focus on the engineering need, and we're going to make the math match the engineering need. So we're going to have low latency. Uh, we're also not going to rely on interleaving. If anything, if there is any uh, correlation or any temporal structure or any other kind of uh, correlation, uh, say across channels in the noise, we're going to use it. Uh, we're not really going to look at capacity, although we will see that this is capacity achieving. We're going to show that we can strive for the highest rates available at short block length. Um, we are going to look at flexibility. We want a single decoder, uh, which is efficient and accurate for all codes. Um, maybe not short is not the right uh, um, description for, for all codes with uh, moderate redundancy. Uh, and we're going to look at having robustness. We're not going to fight noise correlation. We are actually going to reuse it. Okay, we're going to make the math look like the engineering. Okay, uh, what does theory tell us about these short codes, by the way? I would encourage you to look if you're interested at this nice uh, GitHub repository that's curated uh, by my colleague at MIT, Professor Yuri Poliansky. Uh, here is capacity again. Bear in mind, I haven't told you about capacity, although many of you may already be familiar with it from a pr uh, prior course, but don't, no worries if you are not, we will get to it. Um, but I just want to say that if you have a code length, like remember I showed you that uh, 300 uh, code length um, in, the, in the example that, uh, that we showed in that little cycle, of coding, um, the, the, the highest available rate is upper bounded here by, by, this, uh, by this red line. And there's some achievability results. Now these achievability results, I would say are theoretical. That is to say, they do not, these are not achievability results that come with a, a practical uh, ready-made encoding and decoding uh, suite 
um, of, of codes at these different lengths. Okay, so the best we could ever hope to do, of course, would be somewhere between the red and the purple. The red is a converse, and you can see that you are going to be somewhat below capacity. Therefore, these code lengths, if you want to go short, uh, capacity may not be really the right metric. What code constructions do we have? Remember, I just mentioned to you um, that typically we only have a fairly limited number of code constructions. There are some classic codes, read Mueller codes, read Salman codes. Um, you can see that they're only available at certain lengths. In some cases, they're only available at certain rates. Remember the rate being uh, the ratio of the number of bits in X to the number of bits uh, in the original um, uh, data to be transmitted. So in the example that we saw in our previous slide, that was uh, two over three, 200 over 300. Uh, there are ways of filling in some of these gaps uh, by doing techniques such as puncturing. Those techniques usually come with losses and they also don't fill in all the gaps and uh, puncturing is, tends to be a very ad hoc complicated approach. Um, if I look at some of the more modern codes, like say the 5G type codes that I mentioned, I mentioned LDPCs, low density parity check codes um, in the, the new radio for the control channel. It uses CRC aided uh, polar codes. Uh, and these are the rates achievable by those um, and the lengths achievable by those codes. Again, you can puncture, uh, but very much at your own risk in an ad hoc and in if often inefficient manner. The theory that I just showed you would tell us that whatever we can do, it's somewhere between the red and the blue, okay? Um, so still the, the, the theory of what's possible and the praxis are very, very far from each other. Now, what, we, what you're gonna learn how to do uh, at the end of this lecture is actually get all of these points by using grant, okay? So we're gonna be, I'm gonna show you a simple way of with the same decoder achieving all of these points, which are, you know, as numerous as you want. They're not restricted to just a few lengths or a few rates like uh, the classical codes have. Uh, and are better than the best known theoretical achievability bounds, which are actually not in themselves a feasible approach we're gonna get all of these points, okay? One of the questions, of course, what would you use if you had a universal decoder, right? Because really the reason for using these codes is that the codes need to be decoded, okay? Um, and at this point you might say, well, what do you mean they need to be decoding? How hard is it? Let's go back to Shannon uh, and let's go back to the different uh, uh, possibilities of what my transmission can be. So um, I mentioned that Shannon identified the maximum rate where out of true and possible strings, a code book uh, has rate R when it has two to the NR possible code words. Going back to our picture before, and here was 300, R was two third. There were two to the 200 possible uh, original strings. Let's call them messages. That's the usual terminology. Uh, and there's only two to 200 possible messages, even though the um, code words were of length 300. And therefore, I could have chosen any two to the 300 possible uh, strings to transmit. Uh, code words to transmit, okay? Um, we want this R to be, of course, as high as possible. And what Shannon said is that the highest R is one minus H. If H is, I'm um, just using shorthand, the entropy of the noise. So remember that my noise, if it's a binary symmetric channel and it has a uh, probability P of bit flipping, 
um, that noise would have an entropy which is uh, very low. If you use, if you remember the um, formula for entropy that we saw in our uh, overview lecture on entropy, um, this uh, this would give you by a simple a Taylor series expansion in a noise which is of the order, um, an entropy of the noise, which is of the order of P, the big flip. Okay. So let's remember, going back again to our course on information theory or our overview of entropy in the first lecture, um, how many, let's think of the typical set and how many typical um, uh, strings do I have? So what I used here in the compression of the data is that to go from 400 bits to 200 bits was that um, the, I could represent the data really with two to the NHS strings. So N in this case was 400 and therefore I could represent these strings of length 400 um, with a set of, of two to the 200 strings and therefore I only require 200 bits. Let me look at the different n here, which is the n of the length of the x. I just don't want to be dragging too many n's around. Uh, what happens here is I have two of the nr strings being sent. Okay, so here in this case I have two of the 200 strings, possible strings being sent. And let's look at the noise. If I was considering the typical set of the noise. Um, if I was able to, for instance, do compression on the noise, I should be able to represent it with just two to the NHN strings. So even though the noise is itself a string of 300 bits, um, with high probability, um, almost all of them are going to be in a much smaller set. Uh, and indeed, I'm going to have that the typical set here is only two to the NHN. So what does that mean? Well, if my nose was, uh, say, with probably, uh, was a, uh, represent a Bernoulli a random variable with probability P over one, like we saw before in the binary symmetric channel, then what would happen here is that my HN would be tiny, it would be 10 to the minus three. My n here is at 300. It means that really, for all intents and purposes, my typical set for the noise is tiny. It's really of order one, okay? Um, now, of course, I don't get to compress the noise. As a matter of fact, I don't get to observe the noise by itself uh, because the noise here, I only observe it added to the X that was transmitted. Now, the channel output here has length two to the n, has length n, which here is 300. And um, I might have up to two to the 300 possibilities for my channel output. Why? Okay. So what does that mean? Well, let's look here. So I have two to the n possibilities, so two to the 300 possibilities for y. Okay, I have two of the NR possibilities for, um, for the data. We agree that the most unobtrusive, well-behaved, uh, trying to be as uh, helpful as possible noise would be a noise that conveniently and obligingly placed itself at the end of my transmission, right? So if instead, of interfering with my data the way it does here, it simply waited for the data to be sent and then added itself at the end, then actually I wouldn't even need to code. I would just send the data and the noise would come to place itself at the end. In that case, what I would have is I would have two to the NR possibilities. I would have Two to the nr possibilities for the data. Okay, 
And then at the end, I would have, if the noise was so nice as to actually even compress itself to take up as little space as possible to take as few bits as possible due to the NHN. Okay, so this would be the data that comes up front and this would be the noise. And all of that would have to fit in um, N bit strings. Okay, which means that my to the end strings, okay, in order for me to distinguish the noise from the data, even if the noise were to represent itself as efficiently as possible and place itself at the back of the data, um, it would have to be that one would have to be greater than or equal to R plus H of N. Just looking here at R, just looking here at our exponents, right? So if I just look here, I have a one, you have an H of N, you have an R, okay? And therefore that means that R has to be less than one minus H of N, okay? So just from this, you can see that there is an upper limit on my R, and indeed it's easy to see, this is the easiest coding theorem you'll ever see, um, that I should be able to, I shouldn't be able to have my R be greater than one minus H of N, okay? Because that would be the data and then the transmission. All right, but that's not what happens with the noise. The noise doesn't obligingly place itself at the end of the data, okay? It doesn't say, okay, here's the data now, here I place myself just as the noise in compressed form at the end of the data. That's not what happens. The noise instead gets mixed in additively with the data. And what Shannon told us is, by the way, I'm able to get arbitrarily close to this R, not quite to the R, but I'm actually able to get arbitrarily close to this R. How? How does Shannon do that? Well, this is how he suggested to do it. What he said is the following. I'm going to construct a code word in a possible way, in this possible way. I am going to take this n to be large, so not just 300 maybe, like I showed you before, much longer. Remember that I showed you that uh, LGPCs in 5G new radio are multiple thousands. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a code book in the following way. I'm going to take all to the NR possible input strings, this is like 200 strings in our example. Okay, those are called messages. And then I'm going to create a bag with all possible two to the three, with all two to the 300 possible strings of length 300 in the example that we showed before. And I'm going to make a code book in the following way. I am going to take one, the first message, I'm going to dip into my bag of possible code words, my bag with two to the 300 possible code words, and I'm going to assign at random a code word to that message. That's going to be that code word that goes with that message. I then replace that length 300 string into the bag, take the next message, so with a replacement, I'm going to take at random uniformly from the bag of two to the 300, plank 300 uh, code words. And I'm going to take the second message and assign it to this randomly selected code word and so on and so forth. 
And this is going to make my code book. This assignment of messages, well, to do the 200 messages to, um, um, to length 300 uh, strings selected out of these two to the 300 possibilities. That is going to be my code book. Okay. And there's going to, of course, be sparsity because uh, here I have far fewer code words than I have. Um, then I have possible um, possibilities of code words. So I have two to the 200 code words, but I only have uh, out of two to the 300 possible uh, code, um, two, 200 code words out of two to 300 possible strings. Okay. Now, this is fine. This is how I made my code. And now how do I decode? How do I look at the Y and recover the original X? So something is going to suppose that this is the code which I was sent, the one here in pink. The string Y that was received was a different string. Okay. Now in this case, it was not another code word. It was not one of these other gray uh, code words. It was some arbitrary other code word, which I'm showing here in brown. His decoding idea was for each output Y of N, I'm going to determine the maximum likelihood. It's really the maximum a posteriori, but by doing the compression, we had actually gotten uh, an almost uniform uh, distribution on those inputs, on those length 200 strings uh, that gave us uh, that gave us the axis. Uh, so I'm going to look at all the possible code words that were sent. Again, um, assuming that they all have the same probability maximum a posterior and maximum likelihood are the same. And I'm going to say, here's the Y, here's the output that I've observed. I'm going to take um, the argmax of my codebook, such as it was constructed in this following fashion, and I'm going to call that the received codebook. Okay. Now, where is the difficulty behind uh, Shannon's idea? So the n, as I said, could be long. We saw lengths of multiple thousands. Say that it's even just a thousand and twenty-four bits. I'm choosing that because 128 bytes. And my r, as we've seen, we would like to be uh, we would like to be large. In which case, uh, r is uh, if I say r is 0.9, then to the n r is already very large, 10 to the 277. So why don't we just do what Shannon said? There are two sides to it. Let's first look at the encoding, that mapping of the message to uh, one of the length 300 strings, in this case, say length 1,000 uh, bit strings, um, that was picked out of the bag. How can I store that many strings and their associated messages. That would take a huge complexity because remember that my assignments were random. They were completely arbitrary. There's no shorthand for um, describing that assignment. The second is at the decoding and that's a computational complexity. How do I, every time that I get a Y here, look over all the possible code words and actually figure out which one was the most likely. It's a huge computation. So you have a storage in the encoding, you have a computation in the decoding, and this is why Shannon's idea by itself is difficult. Um, if I were to look at doing a brute force decoding, what I would have is I would receive the Y which is the transmitted code word X plus the noise N. I would compute the posterior probabilities of all the code words. I would do this computation for all the code words. I would select, I would rank order them and select the one which is highest. I would have to the NR computation every time I receive y, a Y. The ML code word, maximum likelihood code word would be the highest maximum posteriori, as I mentioned, with uniform input distributions for the messages, maximum likelihood and maximum posteriori are the same, okay? 
So if I use the random coding that I just described to you, the scheme is capacity achieving, but it has exponential complexity, both in rate, but most importantly, also in code length. Okay, so that's the difficulty. Uh, and that is why there has been the field of coding where you do different type of block codes. Uh, I put modern here between uh, quotation marks in the 1990s, low density pair check codes we have mentioned, which I have mentioned early in this lecture, we actually discovered in the early 60s, but were rediscovered um, in the early 2000s. Uh, modern codes do include turbo codes, um, which were created in the early 90s by Biro Glavieu and Titi Magina. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in the more recent history of coding, we have polar codes, which are um, which were the first set of provably capacity achieving codes. Um, I won't talk about uh, these other kinds of codes, which are more network related. Um, but I have uh, spoken at one of the summer schools um, on network codes previously. Okay, so remember these two difficulties behind Shannon's idea, one uh, around the storage, the other one around the computation. So the storage, which was particularly with the encoding scheme, uh, it turns out that that difficulty has been fixed since the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and the idea is that we can restrict ourselves just to linear codes uh, we can choose a random generator matrix where the mapping from the length, say, 200-bit string to the length 300-bit string is done by multiplying by a matrix of dimension 200 by 300. And the elements of that matrix are chosen randomly. Uh, they can be chosen randomly in binary, or they can be chosen randomly um, often more efficiently over a larger uh, field size than field size of size two, but basically that is what we're doing. So my mapping from uh, my message of length 200 So what I would do is to create, so if I have the, the message, I would create my x here be in effect from my um, input, let me call it um, w. The way I would do it is I would multiply it by a matrix, which would be linear over a finite field. Okay, and this one would be randomly chosen. Randomly meaning ID, random selection of all of the elements in this matrix. Okay, and therefore I don't need to store the whole mapping. I only need to store this matrix. Okay, just need to store this matrix. All right. So uh, going to this evolution of codes, basically it's not just Shannon's approach that we knew to be capacity achieving but not used. We actually had this other approach which was developed by Gallagher, let's say from late 60s, early 70s of random linear codes. I'm showing here in dark the codes that were practically uh, uh, deployed. And I'm showing here in uh, lighter color, uh, the codes that were theoretically known, uh, but not practically deployed. And why they, were they not practically deployed? Because the second problem, the problem of the complexity of decoding remained, okay? So the complexity of decoding remained and therefore because of that we were still not doing um, uh, we were still not doing uh, those uh, capacity achieving approaches the first one proposed 
by Shannon, of course, was um, too difficult even from the code storage perspective. The second one proposed by Gallagher was not too difficult from the code um, um, construction perspective, but was difficult from uh, the decoding perspective. All right. So people therefore did other things. Uh, one of the things that they did uh, was, for instance, they used um, certain kinds of codes like um, um, uh, like tree codes, and they looked at sequential decoders. Um, what they did is they received the lie, the transmitted code or plus noise. Um, they computed a posterior probability of all code words um, for the computations for each received code word, and they guessed according to an a posterior probability order. So they didn't compute all of them at once. They did so in a sequential way, as the name indicates. And they guessed according to prob posterior probability order what the uh, what the possible x was. They checked if the decoding was a transmitted code word, and in this fashion, in this fashion, they were able to um, they were able to get a maximum likelihood decoder. So it guesses and checks sequentially for certain types of codes, for tree codes, which we won't go into. It requires, of course, the known statistics. Um, and it basically gave a complexity, which was approximately constant up to something called the cutoff rate. Um, and in the mid-1990s, uh, Erdal Arakan, who was also the inventor of the polar codes, um, showed why this cutoff rate, which we'll tell you later what it is, was actually a, a practical limit. Basically, the, the, uh, the complexity here was X was more or less uh, of this kind of decoding, more or less a constant up until the rate hit the cutoff rate, which is the low capacity. And once you hit the cutoff rate, the complexity uh, went uh, exponential, went through the roof. We'll see later why. Uh, you then later had this exponential complexity in rate and code length as you would have had in this brute force decoder where you had rate and code length exponential complexity. Okay. Um, this work maybe didn't get that much attention in the, in the mid 90s, why? Well, recall that by that time, basically turbo codes had come around. Turbo codes uh, were capacity achieving and had been shown empirically to be so. And people were starting to rediscover that low density pair check codes, uh, which had more or less lain dormant since the early 1960s, had been also, were also capacity achieving. The difficulty, of course, was neither of these was provable. Uh, the decoding in all of these cases was uh, probabilistic and in practice worked very well, but it was also very difficult to say anything about it. Um, it was actually this fact that you had a complexity that was constant up to the cutoff rate uh, that led uh, Arakan to consider increasing the cutoff rate. Um, and he has very nice description of how that, um, that um, desire to increase the cutoff rate was behind his creation of polar codes, which in effect work um, by increasing uh, the cutoff rate of those codes. Um, there's also nearest neighbor decoding, um, where you receive the transmitted code word plus noise, or you receive that Y. You list noise sequences in increasing Hamming weight. A Hamming weight is the number of ones. Um, and code words are designed to have large minimum Hamming distance. That's to say difference in their, uh, uh, difference in you know, how many places they correspond. They, uh, the, the ones and the zeros in the code word are, are the same. So you want to have them to be as, have as many differences as possible. Minimum Hamming distance means the two code words with the smallest number uh, of differences uh, in their sequences. Um, this is a maximum likelihood decoding when the noise sequence falls at the Hamming weight, um, but in general is not uh, 
but it's not adaptable uh, to uh, to different kinds of uh, noise noise uh, statistics. Okay, so let's go back to these principles of coding. So remember, I have these two to the n possible strings at the output. So to the 300 possible strings at length 300. Uh, my noise with high probability only has is to the nh uh, strings. My input only has to the 200 possibilities here. How am I going to decode? But this is what Grant does. So the decodings that I mentioned to you before were all really um, centered around, so for instance, the brute force maximum likelihood decoding, the Shannon approach, were all centered around X. All of the things that I mentioned, the sequential decoder and the nearest neighbor, all looking at Y and trying to figure out what the X was. But the thing is, this is big. Okay, this is big because you want R to be as high as possible. And of course, in the kinds of um, concentration to the mean results that underlie typical um, information theory results, the end is also large. We saw in those uh, curves uh, that came out of the Spectre GitHub um, um, code that that's not the case uh, always, that you, know, you, you might be able to use a much smaller end and still get an excellent rate, certainly higher than the rates that are being uh, deployed in much of the state of the art right now. But you know, this is large. However, this is small, right? Remember, even if my n were to be, say, a thousand, uh, the h is itself, uh, the h of the n is itself around, you know, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, which means that the set, the typical set here, so this is the, this is the, um, cardinality of the typical set, the typical set here is just not that big. So instead of looking at this, which is hard because there's a whole lot of them and we want there to be a whole lot of them, we want the R to be large, although you know, we don't want the N to be huge, but still large enough. Let's look at something which is order one. And how are we gonna do that? It's sort of, um, you might think that it's inspired really by, by this idea of, uh, of decoding by looking, by guessing over the x's, but except I'm going to guess over the n's. So I have a yn, and I'm going to have a code book membership test, which means that this is my description of whether something is in the code book or not. In the case of a linear code, what it means is that I am going to simply uh, check using the type of matrix multiplication uh, that I mentioned before, I'm simply going to check whether a code word is indeed uh, is indeed uh, correct. Um, so my output is going to be my best estimate of my code word, which I'm denoted of length n, which I'm denoted by c star. Okay, and I'm also going to output q, which is actually how much time it took me, how many tries it took me to obtain that code. Okay, so I start with no tries, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have my noise effects ranked from most likely to least likely. In the case of the nearest neighbor decoding, that was in Hamming distance, but in general, it would be whatever distance makes sense or whatever order makes sense given the statistics of the noise. I'm gonna take Y of N and this notation here is to show subtraction of the noise effect, okay? So I'm subtracting the noise effect, not necessarily the noise itself. That will become important later when we look at uh, soft decoding, decoding with soft information. So it's the noise effect that I'm looking at, okay? I want you to really think of the noise effect. I'm not interested in the noise itself, I'm just interested in the noise effect. Of course, in the simple case of a binary symmetric channel such as we have presented, then the noise effect and the noise are the same because if I know that bit was flipped, which is the noise effect, that immediately gives me the noise. But in general, um, the noise may not, uh, the noise effect 
um, may be more limited than the, all the possible noises that may have led to that potential effect. So I'm using this notation here to note subtraction of the noise effect. Uh, and if by subtracting the noise effect, by in effect inverting the noise effect, let's think of inversions, you know, talking about subtraction is really the inversion of the noise effect uh, on the received Y. If the result of that is a valid code word, um, so if it's if that's in the code book, then I say that then that is indeed the maximum likelihood uh, uh, code word. And I return that along with how many times I had to guess a noise. If it's not the most likely noise, if the most likely noise effect being removed from the Y, being inverted from the Y does not actually lead to a, um, does not actually lead uh, to a code word, then I go um, to the next most likely and so on. Okay, so the Q shows how many different noise effects I had to look at. In effect, it gives, um, it gives a measure of how uh, certain I am about my decoding. The larger Q, uh, the less certain I am about my decoding. Okay, let's just quickly remind ourselves of why this is, why this is truly a maximum likelihood decoder. So the channel output is input plus noise. The maximum likelihood decoding is the arg max the, uh, of over all possible C's code words. I'm going to denote by count C and the code book of length N uh, of so the of the possible C's of the Y given the C's, which is also Coincidentally, the R max of the N, where the N is the inversion of taking out the C basically from the Y. Now we always think of it, uh, we always think of it in this way. We always think of it as, you know, codebook centric. The, don't think of it as noise centric, but the two are equivalent. The two are the same, okay? So what we're doing here is we're actually concentrating on this framing of the problem where I'm looking at guessing of all the noises. And if one noise effect is higher than in probability than another noise effect, so if this noise effect is more likely than that one, if then um, this, is in the, uh, this is in the code book, then this is the maximum likelihood decoding and it's more likely than this code word uh, having been transmitted, okay? So this is a noise-centric maximum likelihood decoding, but it is the same as, um, um, it's not the same in complexity, but it's the same um, in result as the um, codebook-centric maximum likelihood decoding. Okay. So um, our new algorithm is the following. Uh, I have a received transmitted code word plus noise. I'm ordering the noise sequences. Okay, so important to remember it's the noise sequences that I'm considering in decreasing probability. So from highest to lowest, I subtract a noise sequence. If it's in the code book, then I return the first identified code book. So subtract here again, think of it as invert the noise sequence effect. Okay, I'm just being a bit uh, um, uh, easy about the, you know, a little bit sloppy, but again, it's subtract the noise effect, okay? Um, which, in the binary symmetric case is not different, but in general will be different. All right, and the first yes, that's my ML decoding. Okay, the first time I hit, I hit one, I shout bingo and that's my ML decoding. I can leverage the noise statistics however I want here, okay? So if I have correlation, we'll see that later, I can definitely use it. 
Okay, so let's just give ourselves a little bit of an example of how this would work. The way this would work is suppose going back to the example we had before that I had this 8-bit string where the last bit was flipped. I'm first going to guess all zeros. If I have, say, a binary symmetric channel, this would be um, this would be the most uh, likely noise. Uh, remember that we are going to guess from most likely to least likely, even though if you recall what we did in our lecture about um, entropy the and the typical set, this might not be in the typical set. The most likely string might not be in the typical set, uh, but of course. If I guess from most likely to least likely, um, it's still going to be the case that I will stop and we'll use that later before I go out of the typical set because with probably one, if with probably close to one, I am in the typical set, with probably even higher than that, I am in the to the NH most likely um, uh, set of most likely strings. Okay, so it's quite clear that the set of the set of to the nh of n, the probability of the set of to the nh most likely. most likely noise strings is that probability has to be, of course, greater than or equal than the probability of The typical set has roughly this many. And the most likely have to have a probability, which is, of course, very equal to the elements of the typical set by definition. Okay. All right. So I start out with the most likely, even though it's not in the typical set. Um, that's still going to work best. And if and then I subtract that effect. And if that's not a code word, which in this case it's not, then, then uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to choose the next, most likely, let's say a one at the end. Very often, and we'll see that later in some of the practical examples, um, if I'm going to have errors, it will tend to be towards the end. That's sort of when my transmission is getting more flaky. Um, so, for instance, I could take into account statistics by guessing that an error is more likely to occur at the end uh, rather than at the beginning uh, of a transmission. In this case, this is a code word. Actually, that was the code word that we had transmitted. So, yes. So, this is my maximum likelihood decoding, and we are done. All right. So, basically, what has happened here? Uh, it's something where I have looked um, at a scheme which is noise centric. After some number of guesses, if I only had a single code word that was transmitted, eventually I would identify the true noise. Okay. However, what will happen is, of course, I don't have a single code word to be transmitted. If there was a single code word to be transmitted, my rate would be zero, my R would be zero, and that would be a very interesting communication scheme. Um, so what there is, is there's actually a difference between the transmitted code word and other code words. Well, you can think of those sequences as a code word difference noise, okay? So here's the sent code word. There's some noise sequence that maps it to uh, the received code word. But there's also a noise sequence that would map the sent code word to another code word. Say this one. Okay. 
And the point is, I want to, to decode correctly. I want to guess the noise sequence, which I'm going to denote in a different color, say red. So I want to guess this red noise sequence that mapped me from here to there before I guess this one or any of the other blue sequences. So I have all these different noise sequences mapping, you know, that when I add them to this light pink code word, map me to these. I want to guess those after I guess this one. So there's only one of these red ones. How many are there of these blue noise sequences? Well, there's two to the N R, of course, minus one, because uh, this is how many code words there are, but I have the original code, okay? So there's to the NR of these code word difference noises, these blue ones. And if one of those were queried in my querying from most likely noise to least likely before the true noise, then I'm going to have an error in my decoding. Okay? So if I guess this one before I guess this one, then I'm going to have an error. Okay. Now, how am I going to manage that? There's a race between guessing the actual noise, the red noise, the correct output, uh, and the code word difference noise, the incorrect output. Now, if I use random uniform code box, as Shannon told us to, what will happen is the following. The location of these code with difference noise sequences in the guessing order is gonna be uniform. Uh, it's just think of a Bernoulli random variable with probably one half of zero, one half of a one. That's what these code with difference noises would be because all of the um, code books were chosen randomly, uh, uniformly, independently, and therefore, the probability that at any particular uh, bit in a code word, it is the same or different from any of the other code words is one half, okay? Which means that the expectation until I guess any one of these, uh, uh, of these code words, code book difference noises for one particular uh, Code, uh, for any one particular code word is, so for any one particular code word, it's one over two to the, um, it's roughly one over uh, two to the N, okay? Uh, and, that means that the expectation um, of the, the number of guess bit there are, this is for any one of those um, code word difference noises, but how many um, of those code word uh, difference noises do I have? I have two to the NR you know, minus one, but who cares about the minus one? Um, so basically what I have here is by just doing a very simple, um, a, a very simple um, bound, what I have is this is the number two to the, uh, this is the studio NR is the number of code word difference noises. This is, um, the, this is, if I look at the number of guesses uh, until I guess one of the, um, uh, until I guess one of the, um, code word difference noises, it's actually um, this inverse. 
uh, this is the this is the probability of any one of the cold war noises. So I keep guessing, and by doing a again a, a Bernoulli expectation, it's going to be this inverse. So what do I have? Uh, I am going to I'm going to have that the um, the number of guesses until I guess the, the first code word difference noise is going to be to the n. And here I have this probability that I guess one of those. And so I'm going to take the inverse of that, which is going to give me this. Okay, so this is basically the probability that I guess any one of um, by you know by union bound that I guess any one of, at any one time any one of those uh, um, what were difference noises so this is the probability and I take the inverse of that to look at the expectation of the number of guesses until I guess to one of these uh, what were difference noises which will lead to an error okay. So this is the, at any one guess of of a, of a noise, this is the probability that I hit one of the code word difference noises, okay? This is probably I hit any one particular one of them. There's roughly two the NR of them, union bound. This is what I count to the NR minus one. And by using a Bernoulli um, expression, I look at the probability of guessing and I look at the time until I guess, and that's how I go from here to that. Okay, so the inversion means that my R minus one becomes a one minus seven. Okay. So it's clear that guessing from most likely to least likely is optimum. So having this uh, guessing order, where I guess in decreasing order of uh, noise probability is, is obviously uh, optimum. The G here stands for the guess word, which is the number of queries until the true noise is identified. Um, and the average number of guesses until an error, as we just uh, as we just argued, is going to be of the order of two to the n one minus r. This is actually uh, not the same as the uh, uh, average number of guesses to the true noise, which is going to be roughly two to the n h to the one half. This is the Renyi entropy of order one half. I'm not going to cover it in this main part of the lecture. There will be a separate lecture um, in this series where you can, uh, where I will go a little bit more in uh, detail uh, about um, these different notions of, of entropy uh, and the guessing. Uh, I don't want to include that in this main part of the lecture uh, so that the lecture is, is more accessible. However, for those uh, among you who wish to go more in depth, I encourage you to look at that optional extra lecture to see how that works. So uh, the average guesses to the actual noise would be to the NH by one half, but actually, um, what's happening here is that this would lead me to something a little weird because um, if I really had to guess to the actual noise, uh, then that would mean that I would need the number of guesses until one of these incorrect code difference uh, noises um, to be, uh, to happen after the noise to the true guess, which would then by looking at the exponent means that the rate would have to be less than one minus h one half. This, by the way, is the famous cutoff rate that I mentioned before that I told you we would uh, revisit. This here is the cutoff rate. And remember that I told you that in the mid 90s, Arakan had shown that the cutoff rate, which had been considered as, as a folk theorem to be the practical limit 
of transmission that the cutoff rate was indeed given by um, was indeed uh, the limit uh, in these sequential decoders uh, where the complexity went from being constant to being uh, exponential and unmanageable. Um, so this would seem to say, well, if I really want to guess to the true noise, it has to be that I have to send at this rate. And H one half, as I mentioned, is uh, higher than H. So this ring entropy of order one half is are higher than h. So that this would make it look like my maximum likelihood doesn't get me to capacity. What am I missing here? What am I missing? This would mean this would seem to mean that I'm looking at this maximum likelihood, but I'm having to guess the real noise. It's not really um, that I need to guess the real noise always. Sometimes I won't be able to Sometimes I will guess with an error. So really what I need is not necessarily to guess the real noise. Uh, I just need to guess the real noise with high probability. So that means that with high probability, I will guess the noise after two to the NH possibilities. Remember, I'm looking at the two to the NH most likely sequences. The two to the NH most likely sequences have a probability which is at least as large as the probability of the typical set, which has to the NH elements. And therefore, since the typical set has a probability which is arbitrary, which is very close to one, the to the NH most likely sequences have a probability which is also very close to one. So I don't need to guess the exact noise always. I just need to guess it with high probability and indeed that's what happens. So basically what happens is this lot of math is what you can uh, actually look at if you decide to look at the optional uh, additional lecture. Um, what happens is I have a race between these, uh, these guesses over uniform distributions of the code word difference noise and the guessing of the real noise. And uh, you can use uh, certain principles, which again, I will leave to the optional lecture. And in that case, you will be able to guess with high probability in any case, the noise, the actual noise effect rather than uh, the code word difference noise. Okay, I just want to show you here a little um, notion of what happens here with the complexity. This is a binary symmetric channel. So ID here, the pro the zero uh, point zero zero one, so ten to the minus three, is uh, this is the P that we have mentioned before. Um, if I did the brute force decoding that uh, we mentioned before, the maximum likelihood Shannon style brute force decoding, uh, what I would have is these lines. Okay, so unless the code book rate was very low, so complexity here, the abscissa you see is in logarithmic scale. Um, code book rate here is in linear scale. You see that I have this very high, um, very, very high. Um, uh, complexity as soon as the code book rate became even moderate. Uh, if instead you look at the complexity of grand, because it doesn't depend on the code book rate, um, really depends on the noise, it just goes down and is flat because it depends on guessing the noise. And it starts to go down here when I start making errors. So it starts going down here. Uh, when I'm more likely to hit uh, uh, another a code with difference noise, which means that actually the complexity of my decoding will go down because of course I now I'm starting to hit um, code word difference noises rather than just the noise itself. Uh, these little, rec these little um, lines here show what happened 
um, this is uh, the block error rate, then this is when I'm sort of exceeding the block error rate. Um, so basically you see eventually I get to, to having errors. Um, if you see something which is Markov here, so bursting some way with correlation, as I mentioned, um, then actually in general, uh, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to uh, often um, guess more quickly by making use of the correlation. Okay, so the average guesswork to the actual noise would be this to the NH one half, or again, if you want to hear about this strain entropy, um, tune in to the other lecture, uh, but most probably shortly after to the NH you will be done, you know, and very likely very soon. Um, by the way, if they have not guessed after some time, is there value to continue guessing, to bumping up the complexity? And the idea is no, because again, you know, I only want to guess within the typical set. After that, I've basically have had a, an atypical noise sequence, uh, which is likely to give me an error. Uh, so there's no point in guessing after some time. So we can abandon grand with abandonment, which we call grand ab, abandons guessing after some number of guesses if no clip book element has been uh, achieved, um, has been identified, and this achieves a significant reduction in complexity. Okay, so now this means that I'm able to decode any code. Okay, remember the grand approach is universal. We didn't make use of the structure of the code. It is, we have shown capacity achieving this, by the way, that will probably be the simplest coding theorem you will ever see, or the simplest um, proof of the coding theorem. Uh, so I now no longer have just these classical codes or even modern codes. I can use any code, including those random linear codes that uh, we were told by Gallagher in the late 60s, early 70s, were capacity achieving. Remember that I promised you at the beginning of the lecture that I would show you how to achieve these points, which are better than what was up until now, the state of the art. Again, remember that these bounds, I'm not gonna go into them, um, that these bounds were mathematical bounds so they were not uh, constructed. Random linear codes, which are available at all rates, and great in theory, had not up until now been put into practice. We have now put them into practice. We get all of these, remember before we had a question mark, we get all of these by random linear codes. Let me show you actually a chip that we have recently developed, which has recently been accepted to the European, um, uh, to, uh, the European Circuits uh, Conference, ESS CERC. Um, this is work uh, done with um, particularly uh, Professor Rabia Zizicido at Boston University, of course, uh, Professor Duffy, whom I just um, mentioned, uh, and several of uh, our students, uh, the ones and postdocs, the ones that are in uh, um, italics are the ones who have graduated. So this uh, chip here, you see the, the picture of the, the chip, here's the dye micrograph. What you can see is that it decodes optimally uh, codes which we already had, maximum likelihood decoders. Here I'm showing some Bose, Chaudhary, Hockenheim codes and some Reed Miller codes. Um, the dashed lines show the theory. The four lines show what was measured with the chip. We're also able, this is a hard decoder, we're also able to decode uh, all other codes, including random linear codes, uh, CRC-aided polar codes, for which up until now there was no hard decoding, there was only soft decoding, we'll talk about that later, random linear codes, for which up until now there was no decoder, we, we mentioned that that was sort of the reason for that whole development of coding was that there was no decoding for random linear codes, even though they were known to be capacity achieving since the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, CRCs, satellite redundancy checks, 
um, actually do beautifully as error correcting codes and are super simple. So a whole different bunch. So all, um, all uh, codes for which there already were um, decoders, uh, hard decision decoders. So hard decision means that you make a decision of whether a received signal was a zero or a one, and later you fix it, but you don't keep any track of how sure you were about your decision or whether a symbol was a zero or a one. Uh, and uh, all other codes for which there were no uh, maximum likelihood uh, hard decoding, such as RLCs, which remember RLCs give you these. All of these are doable, okay? Um, how much does this cost you in terms of performance? This is a comparison with the best uh, in class or the heart uh, decision decoders. Uh, this is an implementation done by the group of, um, uh, of Professor, uh, Professor Gross uh, at uh, McGill University, um, where um, he, they, they did a very nice implementation of our grand algorithm. Um, but it's, it's not in a chip, so uh, there's no uh, latency, um, that there are no measurements because it's, a, it's an architecture. It's an architecture more geared towards um, memory uh, applications. Uh, so if you look here at the average latency in terms of microseconds, remember what we said at the beginning of the lecture, we would like to have short uh, latency. We'd like to have um, low delay. What you can see here is that the delay is best in class. Okay, we're looking at one microsecond versus uh, higher values for the other uh, state of the art. All the other state of the art is for particular kinds of codes, for instance, in this case, BCH codes. We do any code, BCH, but any other code, including RLC and so on. Most decoders are only able to do one particular rate. These are more for storage, so they are able to get to higher rates. We can do a whole range of rates, but in particular, as I said, we can go to this low latency, which was a uh, desiderata. Um, in the second part of the course, uh, we'll be talking about uh, soft decoding. That will be a shorter part of the course. So this lecture forms the bulk of the course. Uh, I will stop and uh, this gives you a chance to take a break. And uh, if you hadn't looked at the first lecture on entropy and you feel that it would be helpful at this point, I encourage you to go watch it now.